Phyllis is an author of the best-selling book, Quilt of Souls. It's a wonderful book. I've read it. It's a story of hope, and I hope everybody reads it. She reveals herself not merely as a quilt maker, but as a captivating storyteller, a historical curator, and a guardian of cultural legacies. Her grandmother shaped Phyllis's childhood, but her 20 years in the military service helped her grow. In 1973, Phyllis joined the Air Force as a WAF, a women's air force, in the women's air force, and one is, was one of the first female aircraft neutralic, am I saying that right? Neutralic specialists for the B-52 bombers. Thank you for your service, Phyllis. She is one of only a handful of women who has served in three major military conflicts, including Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, as a member of the Operation Desert Storm, and Operation Enduring Freedom. Her civilian career included work as a counselor for incarcerated youth and for women who were victims of domestic violence and another 10 years as a counseling supervisor for youth and adults suffering from alcohol and substance abuse. Phyllis is a giver and a remarkable woman. She earned her Bachelor's of Art degree in Sociology and Social Work at the University of Maryland and a Master's Certificate in Creative Writing from the University of Denver. I know Phyllis will incorporate much more of her life into her talk, so I'm going to stop here. But last night, I had the pleasure to get to know Phyllis a little bit more. Her husband, Reggie, where he's in the back. Okay, Reggie's back there. Jan and her lovely friends who drove from Florida and Indiana to give her support today. Um, so all of you, welcome. It's been a pleasure. So on behalf of the Chautauqua Women's Club and the entire Chautauqua community, Phyllis, we are honored to have you with us, and let's give a warm Chautauqua welcome to Phyllis Biffle Elmore. Okay, I'm just going to move this over because I'm not a stand behind the podium person, and it's just unfortunate I can't come down and, whoop, there's a lot of feedback. I, I can't come down and walk and look people in their eyes, but you know, I'll stand right here and I'll, you know, go from side to side, whatever you want. So, but I just want to thank Fran, you know, Fran Redmond, she's, I mean, she doesn't like to be called out, but she's one of the greatest editors I've ever met. And she is responsible for my success as far as tying me into a uh, literary agency and kind of started me on this road, on this Cool to Souls journey, and I am so grateful for her. I am really grateful for her. And this lady here, Kelly, uh, she's, I mean, I can't say enough about you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. You know, this is a big stage, you know, and this is, this is very important for me. I've been doing this for about, since 2015, and I've been across the country, and now I'm just glad to be in upstate New York. I've been to New York City a few times, but it's the first time I've actually had an event in upstate New York. And what better place than Chautauqua, I guess, huh? <laughs> first of all, let me tell you, I'm, I'm a very humble person. And when I say this, I truly mean it. I am so grateful and appreciative that everybody here have came out to see me. Because if I was you, I would be at home sleeping on a day like this, because this is sleeping weather. So thank you so much for being here and listening to me. I really, truly appreciate it from my heart. So, first of all, let me say, this book is not about me. I'm a very humble soul. I'm the granddaughter of Lula Horn Young, a Lula Young Horn that was born in 1883 and she lived to be a, a, almost 105 if she had lived until that entire year, the end of that year. So I just, I'm a very humble person and I just want to give thanks to her and the women of her era who made me into the person that I am right now. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I just want to keep the focus off me and those women who I promised long ago that I would never allow their story to go untold. And I kept my promise. And I'm going to start with 
where I came from. I consider my child of, uh, a child of the great black migration. My parents who were born in the 1920s, they were part of the great black migration. They were born in, 19, in the 1920s, and according to my father, he told me years, a few years before he passed, I, kn I know his father died when he was 13, but I didn't know that he was lynched. And so he left his plow in the field when he, beca when he became 17 and he ran off and he joined the Navy, and he said that he would never go south ever again. The only time he came back was to get my mother and bring her up north, they got married. And during that great migration, it was, it was common for, you know, you, due to economic problems, economic issues. Um, my parents had seven kids, including me. And so it wasn't uncommon for those people in the great, who was involved in the black make great migration to send a child of two down south to be raised by their, by their parents. And that's why I, I coined the term grandmama's other babies, because that's who I was. I was one of grandma's other babies. These were grandmamas raising their children's children. And that was very common in the South, very, very common. And what I'm get, beginning to find out, that was common throughout, no matter what your nationality or ethnic group. Grandmothers raised a lot of children back then. And I didn't realize where I was going. All I remember, it was 1957, I was four years old, and this black car pulled up in my driveway. My sister was braiding my hair. And all I remember is these yellow ribbons dangling in my face and scratching my eyebrow. And I was herded into this car. I didn't have a bag. I remember my, grand, my, my sister throwing an old brown bag in the back. I didn't know where I was going and I didn't ask because back then you didn't ask. Kids were seen and not heard. You didn't ask adults anything. That was adults' business, and I've been told that a lot. And I ended up in a little town called Livingston, Alabama, which was part of Sumter County, Alabama. Livingston was the county seat. Livingston was the larger city, even though it had a population of maybe a couple of thousand back then. Actually, my grandparents lived in a little town called Intercourse, Alabama, which they end up changing to Cortopa, Alabama years later. But Livingston, Alabama, and you have to bear with me because I'm a very visual person, so I want you to not only hear what I'm saying, I want you to feel what I'm saying. Livingston, I mean, Cortova, I should say, was the most beautifulest place you ever wanted to see. The sand was the consistency of table salt. The pine trees were, they were the tallest Alabama pines I have ever seen. And on days like this, or on summer days, you could smell the sap in the air you know, and sitting up under the, under the old oak tree with my grandmother, we would just sit out and just, that smell I will never forget as long as I live. We had a blue spring that ran in front of our house, and you can look down and you can see the tadpoles swimming in it. That's how blue the water was. It was a beautiful place, but there was an ugliness that was pervasive, per per and that was the bigotry that I experienced myself and as well as the people who lived in that area. I, I did some research and I had heard it, but I wanted to research it and kind of understand it myself. But research shows that Sumter County, Alabama, in the 20, during the 20th century, or right into the beginning of the 20th century, Sumter County had more lynchings, both reported and unreported, than anywhere in the South. And I grew, my, when, one of the things my grandmother would tell me when I, when I started, when I began school at the age five, I had to walk to school. That first, the second year I walked to school by myself, but she would never let me go the short route. I always wanted to go the short route because, you know, when you tell a, tell a kid that they can't go somewhere, you just wanted to do it more. And I used to hear rumors, and my grandmother always say, we need to let those spirits be. That's why you need to go all the way around, um, maybe a mile out of the way, just so you won't go down in what they call the waters that comes off the Concabai River. And that's where a lot of lynchings was happening. And my grandmother said a lot of spirits were there and they, we need to let them be. And so I let them be until I was 10 and something, I, something just told me to take that shortcut 
and I'll never, never forget what happened. And you have to read it in the book because it's too long. <laughs> so I'll leave it, leave that, leave that there. But let me go back to my when I first got to Livingston. I mean Cortopa. My grandmother, my grandparents didn't buy anything from the store but Kool-Aid and Coca-Cola and sulfur and maybe baking powder. If it wasn't raised or grown, then we didn't eat. You know, we had more chickens. We had chickens in all colors and sizes. We had more chickens than ants. And that's the first thing that I saw. I remember seeing when I got out of the car, my feet sunk into this white sand, and it was so warm, and it was kind of comforting. But all these chickens was running around everywhere. And when they run, I don't know if you've been around chickens, when you run, they run. When you move, they move. But I was, and my grandmother said, don't worry about they're just as scared of you as you are them. And, but I had to deal with that because I was taken from an environment. Just imagine your four-year-old child, a four-year-old grandchild being taken away, pulled away, taken to a strange place that they've never been to, people that they've never met. That was me. I was four. So I shook every single night. We had no running water. We had only outside toilets. There was no indoor plumbing at all. And that was my environment. We had a two bedroom house with a large kitchen, a wood burning stove, two fireplaces, one in the big, what my grandmother said, her front room, and one in our bedroom. I slept in the same room with my grandparents small aisle down the middle that separated our beds, fireplace in the middle. I learned to tell times about, it, especially in the winter time, when the fire went out in the fireplace, that mean it was getting close to midnight. We had lanterns that we used for, for light. If we need to get up and go to the outhouse, which for some reason they always build in the middle of the, of the field. <laughs> and I, did, I never understood that. And we had the Sears and Roebuck catalog that we used, and I'm not going to just use your imagination. <laughs> so I was taught how to, you know, handle that. So everything was brand new to me. This was uh, my my parents lived in a very beautiful house in Detroit in the suburbs. So it was it, it it took some getting used to. But my but the grandmother was the catalyst to my overcoming the fears and, that I was feeling. Because I wasn't shaking because I was cold, I was shaking because I was scared. So one night, my grandmother got up, she went to the smokehouse, which was where she kept all the salt, back, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the fat back, and all the food for the, for the deer and everything. And she went back there and she kept bags, what I call her bag of rags. She came back with this half-completed quilt. It was about a fourth the size. And she got into bed with me, she wrapped this quilt around me, and it was so comforting. And she, I remember her telling me, I was four, but you know what, in psychology, which I took a lot of, when a child is afraid, either they're gonna do one or two things, they're gonna forget everything or remember everything. And I remembered that because it was so comforting. I remember my grandmother, and just the description, I usually bring a picture of her and sit it there. She was chocolate, she was like Hershey chocolate. She had grayish blue eyes, which was just so soothing and so comforting. And I remember her getting in the bed with me and through the firelight, I could see those gray blue light eyes looking at me. And she started humming, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Then she, told, she said, this is your quilt now. I'm gonna put my folks clothing in there and this quilt gonna follow you for the rest of your life and it's gonna comfort you. I, I didn't really pay any attention. All I knew, you know, a kid four years old only thinking the here and now. We don't think too much. I didn't think too much about what she said was the future. But she wrapped that quilt around me and from then, from that point on, she would sit in the front yard and she would sew piece by piece by piece my grandmother only used fabric or clothing from people who passed on. She would not use mixed cloth in her quilts. People's family would pass on and they would bring my, gr my, my grandmother a bag of clothing and she would turn them into beautiful quilts. And I would sit there and watch and if she knew the story of those people, she would tell me the story. 
and they were amazing stories. And not only old people down south, and, and when I say old people, that's a fond expression that we use down south. But old folks down south, they don't tell you the story once. They tell you over and over and over. I heard these same stories till my grandmother passed away in 1988. The stories never changed. My grandmother, to tell you about her life and how she possibly got into sewing quilts, making quilts. Her parents was born in the 1840s. Now, go back to Koitoba. Koitoba was approximately 60 some miles from Philadelphia, Mississippi. It sat right at the Mississippi, Alabama border. Some of the most atrocious things happened in that span between border Alabama and border Mississippi. We were 60 miles from Selma, 132 miles from Birmingham. So just to give you some geographical signposts of where, where, where exactly we were located. But my grandmother was born in Sanderson, Mississippi, which was next to Laurel, Mississippi. She grew, her parents were born in the eight, around the 1840s. That's how much we, we pretty much deduced it to the 1840s. Her parents, and my, my grandmother was born in the same plantation that her parents were enslaved. And my, my grandmother would tell me how three of her siblings were sold in slavery as babies. And as a result, her mother always thought that she would never have any more kids, that she was barren because of the pain and hurt of her children, of her three babies torn away. But in 1876, my grandmother's sister, Ella, came along. Then my grandmother came along in 1888. My grandmother's, my grandmother's mother was surprised by having two kids after she thought she would have any more. But then one tragic night, tragedy struck. Both my, my grandmother's mother, father, and her sister, Ella, who was 17, almost 18 at the time, they were all all destroyed, and I don't want to tell you the story, by the, slave, by the ex slave owner. My grandmother was left alone when she was 13, and she began work, working for the white family. Rogers, but in the book, I say Murphy's because the Rogers are they're, they're prominent, still a prominent uh, family in, in Laurel, but she worked for them for almost 40 years. But she was alone. And as a result, my grandmother had no cousins, no aunts, no uncles, no family members that she knew of. They were all kind of like scattered out as a result of slavery, not to mention the three siblings. So she worked in, La in Laurel until she married my grandfather in the early 1900s. And my grandfather lived in Koitopa. He took, so my grandmother told Doc, Rogers that she would have to leave because she was now married to my grandfather and she was beginning to have children and Doc Rogers didn't want her to leave. So my grandmother used to hitch up what she used to say, this is her exact words, two tired old mules and she used to drive a wagon those 99 miles between Cortopa and Laurel, Mississippi. And it was grueling because my grandmother had little children then my grandfather was pretty much, he had really bad arthritis, so he was pretty much the caretaker. But when my grandmother became pregnant with my mother and her, and her twin brother, she went back to Doc Rogers again and told him that she would not be able to work for him any, any longer. Doc Rogers told her, I tell you what, Miss Lula, if you continue to work for me, I will hire a driver to take you between living, uh, between Cortopa and Laurel every two weeks. And my grandmother said, yes, but she, you know, she said, well, what would that look like, a black woman being chauffeured around over the, going from Mississippi to Alabama every, every week? And he started out with every two weeks, then he changed it to every week, Friday, after, Friday uh, afternoon that driver would take my grandmother home because he did not want to lose my grandmother because she had been with the family for so long. My grandmother was the epitome of forgiveness. 
Sometimes I used to just shake my hand. I, can't, I can never see, and it will never probably run into ever, anybody ever again who is as forgiven as my grandmother. And like I said, my grandmother made quilts of people who passed on. So when she started commuting from Laurel to Cartopa, every time she hit that Alabama line, this racist sheriff would stop them Ask them, what are they doing? And she, even though they explained to him every time, hired by Doc Rogers to take Miss Lula to her home in, in um, Cortope and bring her back, he would call them everything but a child of God. And not only that, he would make them get out of the car, set in the hot sun, you know, because Alabama has these, if those dirt roads, they have a, 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 an embankment in between. So you have the tire, the, that both tire wheels fit over, but you also have this embankment in between. He would make them sit in the hot sun in that embankment. This went on for nine months. My grandmother never flinched. And she told me each time she pulled her over, him, he pulled them over, she would say, thank you very much, sir, kindly. You know, she would be so cordial. And I would just, my used to, gum used to, I mean, I used to be so angry. And then one day, she said things change, and I won't tell you because it's a whole, it's a whole different story. It's, you have to read it in the book. <laughs> but this is my, this is Sheriff Suggs. You will see red and white, I don't know whether you see red and white pieces of shirt. And when she sat in that yard with me and told me she was putting his shirt in my quilt, it was absolutely devastating. I cried until I couldn't cry anymore. And she said, this is your forgiveness piece. This is your forgiveness piece. And I'll always remember that. But then, my grandmother had a way of telling her story. These pieces of clothing are just not thrown in haphazardly, but each piece of cloth fits next to another cloth that tells a story. Sheriff Suggs have a huge story to tell, and you will find it in chapters, bang, 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 in the book. But he, I mean, his story became my story. After I got older and I started, oh, wow. I, now I know what grandmother was talking about. But it took me a long time. But she forgave from the very beginning. And that's the way she was. And I used to wonder, how could she be so forgiven over the things that have happened to her in her lifetime? And she taught me to be that same forgiven person. I am my grandmother's child. So that's my grandmother. This book is about my grandmother and her peers and the people that was, became a part of my sphere. Another person that was part of my sphere, Miss Jubilee. And you'll read her in chapter seven and eight. But she, Miss Jubilee was 103, 104. She was born in slavery sometime during the 1950, early 1950, mid 1950s. And my grandmother would tell me, since I'm there, because my, my grandfather, my grandmother used to make my grandfather go over there and talk to her. And my grandfather used to hate it. She said, well, Miss Lula, every time I go see that woman, she always talk about dying, blah, blah, blah. And she said, Egg, I don't want to hear that. So, but when I came along, it was my turn, and the first time I met Miss Jubilee, I almost fell down and started crying, because she was old. She was very old. She was so old, she had cat-like whiskers coming from her jaw. She had, a little, she had a little goatee. Her eyes were so sunken in her head, you can lay a penny, and it wouldn't move a muscle. She had one tooth at the top, and when she smiled, it looked like a tree in a forest, a lonely forest. And Ms. Jubilee was a different soul, but she was a kind soul. My classmates used to tell me that, Ms. Ju that, that hole outside of Ms. Jubilee's house was really where she was buried. That was the sinkhole. But I was never afraid to go over Ms. Jubilee's. But this one particular time, my grandmother made Ms. Jubilee a quilt. All these years, Ms. Jubilee had held this, held this quilt that belonged to her folks in an old bag outside. 
And Miss Jubilee sent this bag of a rags by my grandfather for my grandmother to make her a quilt. And my grandmother did, and I was, I delivered that quote to Miss Jubilee. Never forget when she opened up that bag, because my grandmother used to, was the best tea cake maker in the area too. And I always went with a bag of tea cakes to Miss Jubilee's house. And those tea cakes was that round, and Miss Jubilee would open up that bag and put the whole tea, tea cake in her mouth. And I used to wonder how with one tooth. I, so I called them one tooth eating Miss Jubilee. <laughs> and I used to just sit there with my mouth open, like, how could this woman chew? I, I, wonder, well, I wanted to know how she chewed a, that pecan that was in the middle. But she took that quilt out of that bag and she held it to her, and that inbreathing that she had as she snipped that quilt. One, I will always remember that sound. She started crying, and sure enough, all those tears landed on that platform in her, in her eyes that sat back so far. And I was just waiting for those tears to come off that platform and run down her cheek. And when she moved, that's, when it, that's what happened. But she cried, and she said, these are my little sisters in my mama and papa's clothes. Miss Jubilee saw her parents and little sister and pregnant mother sold into slavery. And she, and she talked about how they ran behind the wagon and Mr. Hitch grabbed her and said, don't worry, we're gonna be your, we gonna be your folks now. And Miss Jubilee told me that story over and over again until Miss Jubilee passed away. And I'll never forget the story because Ms. not only Miss Jubilee told me, used to tell me slavery tales that used to scare me so bad at night I would get in the middle of my grandparents, and my grandfather was adamant, Miss Lulu, you got to stop Miss Jubilee from telling this child these stories. But she never did. She never did. Miss Jubilee passed away, but I always carry her story with me. And something that she used to tell me all the time, she didn't talk very well, because neither my grandmother nor Miss Jubilee had any formal schooling. Miss Jubilee used to always tell me, I want you to read that now. I want you to read it. And I said, she meant she wanted me to write it down. And she always told me, because something happened to my hands when I was a little girl, too. And Miss Jubilee healed them. And you have to read that story in the book, too. <laughs> but she told me that my hands were meant to do something special. But she said, I want you to rip. I want you to rip what I'm saying. I want you to rip it all. And it's just, I just to hear, I can hear her talking now. That's why I will, I will never allow my grandmother's or Miss Jubilee's stories to go untold. If you see the orange and the yellow and white in the quilt, that, those pieces, those were the dress pieces of Miss Cooter. Miss Cooter was a laundress. Miss Cooter had four sisters. And my grandmother, according to my grandmother, laundresses are the most hardest working people in that ever lived because they wash clothes. My grandmother said they would wash clothes for the, for the whites in town, downtown Livingston on Monday. Those clothes were due back on Wednesday. They would wash the clothes. Wednesday's clothes was due back on Friday. No Winter, spring, summer, and fall. Those clothes was due when those clothes was due. I knew, I knew well what it felt like washing clothes outside because I had to wash our clothes. After, after I turned nine, I was relocated to washing the clothes outside. And in the winter time, that's a back-breaking back, back experience because you got a big black pot. You wash the clothes with my grandmama's homemade devil eye soap and one black pot. You had a silver, two silver, big silver tins that we bathed with. And speaking of bathing, we only bathe three times a week. And when we all use one Wash thing. My grandfather bathed first, then my grandmother, and by the time I got in it, it was syrup. But we all had to use the same bath water. But cooking the clothes on the black pot, use the battle stick to take the clothes out, throw them in the gray tin in the cool water. In the wintertime, it was so cold, we would barely squeeze them out. My grandmother said, just throw them on the line and let them drip dry. And sometimes they would freeze, depending on the weather, but we would leave them out there till the sun come out. And these women, had to do a lot, 18, 19 people's families' clothing. And sometimes they would have to do redos 
because they didn't think that it was done well enough. And not only that, Miss Cooter had three sisters, three bigs. My grandma said they were huge sisters. And Miss Cooter also had an abusive husband who used to come home and beat her and sometimes splatter the, her clean clothes all over the place. And Miss Cooter had to live through all this. And Miss Cooter had two sets of twins, January and June, I think, and April and May, my grandmother said. <laughs> and so this went on year after year after year until Cooter's sisters finally got angry and they took care of him. And you have to read how they took care of him. <laughs> But they took care of business. These sisters got tired. Miss Cooter would come to my grandmother's kitchen. My grandmother used to, used to braid her hair. And there's something about old folks in down south, something about messing around in your hair, lifting dandruff, she called it, and braiding. And Miss Cooter would cry. And Miss Cooter would tell my grandmother, Miss Lula, you're the only one that's seen me cry. You in them bushes over yonder. But Miss Cooter made it through. My grandmother said she died before her time because she had been beat so badly and then with all the arthritis from the washing clothes. She died early. My grandmother sat with me and put her clothes in the quilt next to her sister's, next to my grandmother's sister Ella. And that's when you see those pieces in the white wedding dress for my sister Ella. That's Miss Cooter, orange and the yellow white pieces. And it's a chapter dedicated to her. Then on the other hand, now these were women who, you, something I can never understand, because down south, the tree, you see the white house back there in the back of you? Well, my grandparents' house was set about, I would say about two feet from the ground, and I would crawl up under there. When the folks gather in the front yard, I would crawl up under there with the nasty chickens and run them out of the way, and I would listen. That's the only way I can listen to the gossip and see what they were doing the stuff that I wasn't supposed to hear. And these women used to gather in my grandmother's yard, and I, used to, I was able to look at their eyes, and they talked about slavery times a lot. But my grandmother would ne never, never angry. She would keep them calm. And I used to wonder, they would talk about how people were lynched down at the concubine but nobody seemed to get angry, and my grandmother would keep them that way, and I think only was because my grandmother, my grandmother's ex, um, influence on those ladies that they were able to go forth and pursue the things they needed to do. Now, my grandmother's other friend, Miss Sugar, and I wanted to write Miss Sugar's story because she was a special person to me. She was the opposite of Miss Jubilee, and my grandmother, and probably Cooter, who I never got a chance to meet, but I've heard her story. And I love Miss Sugar because she cussed. <laughs> she had a mouth, but she would never cuss around my grandmother. Miss, Coo <laughs> Miss Sugar, I would go to her house. Miss Sugar had a fabulous house. She was a butter churner. She made her money churning butter. I churned butter. And I know how long it takes to milk a cow get enough to put in the churn, to get enough butter to rise to the top, to make a living. I mean, and I did it for, for my family, me, my grandmother, and my grandfather. Miss Sugar did it for a living, and as a result, she bought a big house in Gainesville, Alabama. So she used to pick me up every now and then and take me to her house. And my grandmother's stories were different than Miss Sugar's, because number one, Ms. like I said, Miss Sugar cussed. And she used to tell me the, the sex stories. <laughs> She talked to me like I was a peer, and she used to tell you, you better not tell your grandma because I'm going to deny it. But Miss Sugar had indoor plumbing. She had running water. She had bubble bath. And I used to take a bath and sit in that tub, and, oh, and I could hear her coming down the hall. If you don't get your little black ass out of that, out of that tub before you turn white, she said, the next time I want to see you, you better have those bed clothes on and ready to come in here and watch Benny and Cecil. My grand, Miss Sugar, loved television. That's the only time I could watch television is at Miss Sugar's house. And she would take out her teeth, put them, in the, put, them in the, put them in the glass of water, and all I hear is plump. And I look over there at her and I say, that's not the Miss Sugar that I know. But she was, Miss Sugar was married to a guy about this tall named Tank. Miss Sugar was about almost six feet. 
Miss Sugar would come, Tank would come in. I used to feel so sorry for him because she used to say, Tank, sit up. Tank, sit down. Tank, go outside. Tank, do this. Tank, go in there and start the fire. Tank, sit up. Tank, sit down. And then she would take him and she would pick him up and give him a kiss. And they would just crack up laughing. I mean, it was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. But this was a different, I'm seeing a different side of woman stuff from Miss Sugar. And it, was, and it was amazing because like I said, it was different from what I learned from grandmother. Because one thing about Miss Sugar is the whites did not mess with Miss Sugar because Mr. Tank's father was Italian from New York and they, and they, and they had a steel, had a liquor steel. And so I think all that was influenced, my grandmother didn't want me to hear anything about it, but Miss Sugar told me the entire story. So it was so interesting hearing her story and she would tell me the same thing over and over again. But it was a contrast and that's what was so amazing about Miss Sugar. And these are, just, these are the women of, of that, that was in my sphere and in my grandmother's sphere and that I had to write about and my, you know, and I'll tell you about my experiences in Alabama and one where my grandmother would have to massage my feelings and try to turn on the forgiveness piece. Sitting on the outhouse, looked at Montgomery Ward catalog and it was patent leather shoes and that's all I wanted was these black patent leather shoes. They were beautiful and the little kids at school had black patent leather shoes. And I wanted some, and I wanted them real bad. So my grandma said, okay, when your auntie come down here, I'm gonna let her take, her, take you to Selma or Tuscaloosa or Philadelphia, Mississippi to buy you a pair of patent leather shoes. My aunt ended up taking me to Birmingham. And when we walked in the store, it was a sign that says, colored, you try, you buy. We couldn't sit down, we had to stand up. We couldn't use the shoe thing to measure my feet because we couldn't put a black foot on that metal piece. So my aunt said, I tell you what, so I, she stood me up, I leaned up against the wall, she took my feet and she measured the outside of my feet to the shoe and the man came running over there, no, 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 you gotta buy this, you gotta buy these shoes. And my aunt said, but they, they gonna be too small. And she said, well, you put it on that, you know, I won't mention the word, so you got to buy them now. And she bought, had to buy those shoes. We got in the car. She was crying. I tried to put the shoes on, and they didn't fit. I was sick. I cried all the way back to my grandmother's house. And my aunt tried to explain to her, but she was in tears, so she couldn't explain. I took those shoes to school with me. I took those shoes to farm with me. I took those shoes everywhere I went. So my grandmother had my grandfather, who was a whittler, take his knife and make those shoes sandals. Only enough so the, so the strap that go across enough to hold and then a little piece to hold my feet in. And my feet went over the shoe, but it fit but my, folk, my feet were actually too long. And I wore them until I couldn't wear them anymore. But it was my grandmother who I would run to in those times to describe my pain and hurt. And it was all about forgiveness. She said, you can't hold that. She used to tell me, child, I don't care whether you're black, white, green, or red. And that's what I have for my motto, we all cry wet. She said, it doesn't matter what color you are, your tears, it's no different from the tears crying from a white mama or a black mama or a green mama. When we lose somebody, we all, we all cry wet. And she said, I don't ever want you to start with the bad in people and work backwards. I want you to look at the good in folks and work forward. And that's have always been my motto, to always look for that positive. And, and I'm going to end with this because I know I'm... When I first started doing these speak engagements, my first engagement was in a place, I can't even remember the name of the town, it was in Kentucky. The lady emailed me, said, what, can you call me? I want you to come and speak. And so I called her and she said, we're a small town in the, in the hills of Kentucky. 
She said, my mother is the most racist person you ever want to meet. Her parents were racist. She said that a lot of people in the town are racist. And she said, but I think they need to hear what you have to say. My God, I really didn't want to go. I really, really, I had to really think that one over really, really carefully. But I went, winding up through those winding hills in Kentucky. When I got there, her mother was in a wheelchair, and she was sitting all the way in the back with, the, with a scowl on her face. And I said to myself, I'm going to try to back this in. So I started talking about outhouses and grandmamas, nothing about race. It was all about shared experiences, being raised by grandparents, growing up in the rural South, having kids, you know, having, you know, I talked about everything, but I never, I stayed away from color because I wanted her to see that we share experiences. I was trying to be my grandmother. And as I talked, she came closer and closer and closer to the front. And when I finished, she was right there on my left side, sitting right in front of me. And when I came, when I finished up, she had her hand out and she said to me, she said, I didn't know colored folks had to go through that. I said, wow, geez, this woman and her mother sent me message until her mother passed. And so I'll leave, I'm going to leave you with that. You know, we have to, we have to really, really cherish, for some reason, all history, yet we just stopped and stopped passing down our oral histories. And that's sad. My grandmother used to say, she took me to this old slave cemetery, and she used to tell me, you see these folks laying here? These are the best stories you ain't never heard. So we need to talk to our elderly people because somewhere within that generation, their kids or kids' kids are going to ask, who are my folks? DNA is telling that right now. So that is what I can, that's, that's, that's my takeaway. That's what I would like for you to take away, I should say. Thank you. Oh, and this is a picture of my grandmother right there. <laughs> you. Do you want to tell them the significance oh. of this? Oh, yeah. Oh, do I have time? Remember I told you my grandmother had no ancestry. Her ancestry was, bro her lineage was broken. Well, what happened was I got into genealogy. And I did my grandmother's DNA. And the, the three children, three of my grandmother's siblings that were sold in slavery, I was able to connect with their lineage. And as a result, they started sending, they started communicating with me. So I'm really good friends with the Quilters of Color of New York, which is a really large quilting guild in New York City. And I told about what was happening with the DNA and connecting with my, finally connecting with my grandmother's people. And I know she, if she was around, she would have loved it. But she said, I tell you what, you have them send me a piece of their ancestors on that, on that side, which was the paternal side. And I, will, and I will make you a quilt. And I said, OK. And so this was the last house coat that my grandmother had on when she passed away in 1988. So I gave her my grandmother's house coat. So what she did was she took my grandmother's house coat and she attached it to their clothing. So this is the quilt that binds. So symbolically, they're alive now. My grandmother is finally connected to her siblings, even in death. And I know she's somewhere, the ancestors are watching, but I do believe that she's happy. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to do Q&A. So if you uh, have any questions, please come to the two mics. Aren't you glad you came today? Okay, I think we have one here. Oh. Hi. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. I absolutely love that. So you, you talk about forgiveness, but how do you process things that are like going on in Florida now 
where it's just all supposed to be forgotten. That's difficult, and I, and I just happen to be from Florida too, so I, I think you, you probably read that all along. You probably <laughs> well, I, I put it like this, and how, how can I put this? I would, love, I would love to go into the school systems in Florida because this, this book is really not about slavery. It's not about any, anything divisive, divisive. It's about coming together. It's about forgiveness. It's about abandonment, which we've all experienced. It's about colorism. It's about sexism, racism. So it covers so many, and you, if you read them, it, will, it covers so many areas. Areas that we have all, either we know somebody or we all have experienced. And that's how you, I, I intend, I would like to bring people in, you know, as a way of, like I said, the oral history, the ancestry piece that's involved in it. And shared experience is a great way of bringing people in the fold. Because you, once you start talking about those shared experiences, you can open up and talk about and have dialogue about other things. That's why that lady from Kentucky was so receptive because she recognized that she also was raised by her grandmother. She also experienced abandonment issues. And that's what we related on. And as a, and as a result, we was able to talk about other things. And that's, I guess that, was, that would be the same thing that I would propose to do in Florida. <laughs> yes. Oh, hi. Um, I'm another Southerner. Oh, hello. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, where do you think your grandmother's forgiveness came from? How was she? A I don't. I have no idea how someone is able to do what she did because I would be so. I'd just be this hard knot of hatred. Right. Yeah. How in the world could she forgive people? I think, I really do believe that it was her deep, deep spirituality. That's the only way I can ever see her being so forgiven. I really, I mean, because her forgiveness was, it was indescribable almost. Indescribable. And it had to become, it had to come from somewhere else. Okay. Something, I really do truly believe that. You know, to be able to forgive, even especially on that road oh, to Florida and Livingston. That image in yeah, my head yeah. is so clear. Yeah, and I trust me and believe I hate, that was something that I. It was a long time before I was able to finally just let that piece go. But if it wasn't for her encouraging me and telling me about, you know, God and the Bible, and my grandmother couldn't read. You know, she couldn't read, but. I would sit there and read Bible verses and she would know if I skipped over something. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, it was, my grandmother was an amazing woman. I just, you know, uh, sometimes I just shake my head how somebody could be. I can tell you stories that happened with my grandmother that it's even worse than, um, than that. But this woman was, she was beyond words. You know, as for, in, in my explanation of her, because people ask me, how could you stand up there and just talk and not read anything? Because I know I'm channeled by my ancestors and those women who I promised that I would never, ever, ever allow their stories to go untold. What you're, what you're doing is so incredibly important. Yes. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for oh, that really, really beautiful talk. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about your work with survivors of domestic violence. In particular, I was struck um, by the story you told of, I think it's Miss Cutter. Uh huh. Um, and um, the, there are strong, strong parallels between a 1926 short story by Zora Neale Hurston titled Sweat. Okay. It's set in Florida and it's the same. It's a woman who washes clothes mm -hmm. and her husband is very, very violent mm -hmm. and he, he throws the clothes around. And um, 
That's often the case in domestic violence, mm -hmm. that the same patterns exactly. are often repeated over and over. Mm -hmm. Thank you again so much. Okay, you're welcome. You know, it's, it's, it's fun because that's why I decided to go in. If you, watch, if you look at my career in counseling, it parallels what my grandmother talked about. I wanted to work with women of domestic violence. I wanted to work with people who were addicted to substance and alcohol. I wanted to, t to work with kids because this is, this is the part for another story, but I was torn from my grandmother and sent back to Detroit when I was almost 13. And I experienced a lot of physical and emotional abuse, you know, based on colorism, based on just my mother was, just became very abusive. And, and I think it was because my grandmother wasn't able to give her the same love she gave me. And so I ended up running away from home. I, I was a street kid for a while. And the only thing that kept me upright was they had, I think, I really do believe that these old women had built that foundation in me to be able to withstand everything that I was going to go through. It was almost like they forced, they had foreseen what was coming down the road for me. And they gave me that strength to overcome all that. Because during all that time, I was safe. I was okay. You know, times where I just said, well, you know, I want to go be with my grandmother. But my mother had told me that my grandmother didn't want me anymore, which was, that was her way of more mental and emotional torture. So I think I got into the field of working because of what I had seen and my grandmother had told me about Miss Cooter and you know my own life experiences. And that's why I got into that field in the first place. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give a huge hand for Phyllis.